much for this wonderful introduction. Um, and it's so lovely to, to join you. I'm going to talk about neuroglial interactions in health and disease, considering uh, their role from cognition to cancer. Uh, broadly speaking, my laboratory um, tries to understand the molecular language that cells use as they work together to build and to remodel the brain. And I want to tell you one story today in two parts about the way in which neurons interact with the glial cells that form the myelin sheath and how we're beginning to understand that this is an adaptive and experience-dependent process that tunes neural circuit function in really important ways. And then how these very powerful interactions between neurons and oligodendric glial cells are subverted in the context of glial malignancies. But I like to start every talk with a broad consideration of neural development. And I think the best way to do that is to show you pictures of my children. So this is my daughter, Sophie, when she was an infant. Um, and by the time we had Sophie, we realized that there are just so many neurodevelopmental to-dos every day uh, that we had to make her a onesie to help her keep track of all of her neurodevelopmental tasks uh, for the first year of life. And it really is amazing when you stop and consider that in the first year of life, human infants make something on the order of 500 billion synapses every day, um, 14,000 new hippocampal neurons, 127 million on average cerebellar granule cell neurons um, in the first year of life. But perhaps the biggest task that human infants have is to myelinate their central nervous system. Humans are semi altricial species. We are born um, with almost no myelination. Uh, myelin begins just before the time of birth and then progresses in a massive wave over the first year, um, beginning around the central sulcus at the time of birth and then progressing towards the poles of the brain, beginning in the cervical spinal cord and progressing down towards the lumbosacral spinal cord. And you can actually appreciate this, um, anyone who has ever. Um, had children or worked with children or remembers being a child themselves, um, you know, in the first year of life, you can really watch human infants motor milestones, um, which reflect that myelination down the spinal cord. So first around three months of age, people um, can, babies can bring their hands together. Um, it can, can keep their head up, begin to bring their hands together uh, by about six months of age. They can sit as myelination progresses down the thoracic cord. And then by the time myelination around 12 months of age reaches the lumbosacral cord, humans often can walk. But myelin is not done developing at the end of this initial wave of myelination that happens in infancy. But actually, myelin development spans at least three decades of human life and follows just really fascinatingly predictable topographical and chronological patterns that follow the principle that in general, more basic neural circuitry like that that underlies um, sensation and movement develops prior to that that underlies more complex neural circuitry such as higher cognitive functions. So, uh, for example, there's a discrete wave of myelination in the brainstem, especially in the corticospinal tracts and the ventral brainstem um, in mid-childhood, while intercortex and intercortical association fibers myelinate much later in childhood during adolescence and into young adulthood. And so this process of myelination, the process by which oligodendrocyte precursor cells proliferate to generate new oligodendrocytes that ensheat the axonal membrane to decrease transverse capacitance and increase the speed of neural impulse conduction, it actually doesn't finish at the end of development, rather continues throughout adulthood in certain regions of the nervous system, such as the neocortex and the associated projections. And you see this in this historical lithograph here, this accumulation of myelin in the neocortex over the lifespan. And this, this is important to understand because it's fascinating, but also because glial malignancies of childhood, adolescence, and young adulthood arise in a spatiotemporal pattern that very closely resembles that of developmental myelination, suggesting that um, dysregulated myelination may have something to do with the emergence of these glial malignancies such that at a time when there's this discrete wave of myelination in the ventral pons, this is when one of the worst human cancers, diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma, tends to occur. And similarly, at a time when there's active myelination of the neocortex and its projections, this is when hemispheric high-grade gliomas of adolescence and young adulthood tend to occur. 
And these observations are concordant with findings from my laboratory and from many others that these real malignancies that we have traditionally called astrocytomas, in fact, arise from precursor cells in the oligodendroglial lineage, either early oligodendrocyte precursor cells or less committed um, precursors destined to go down this oligodendroglial lineage. And so we may learn really important lessons about gliomagenesis by better understanding what normally regulates the process of gliogenesis. And this begs a very basic question about what does regulate the proliferation and functional differentiation of oligodendroglial lineage cells. Well, one idea that's been in the literature for some time is that that axons themselves may regulate the extent to which, that neurons themselves may regulate the extent to which their axons are myelinated. And this could happen in an activity and experience dependent manner. This was an idea that was first proposed by Ben Barris when he was um, a postdoctoral fellow with Morton Raff, um, and then was supported by some really beautiful in vitro work from Doug Fields' lab and um, other correlational studies but it remained a hotly debated topic in the glial field, in part because there are also very clearly activity independent modes of myelination. An oligodendrocyte will myelinate any appropriately sized fiber in a, in a Petri dish. If you put in an inert nanofiber or a formal and fixed axon, um, an oligodendrocyte in vitro will myelinate that. And so they're clearly activity independent modes of myelination, but the extent to which this uh, baseline level of myelination may be modulated in an experience and activity dependent way was something I was really fascinated um, in as a question and something that early in my, my own independent laboratory we sought to answer. Does neuronal activity regulate oligodendrocleal lineage cells, at least in some neural circuits at some points of development or through adulthood? Would myelin be plastic and adaptable? So I'd like to focus this first part of the talk on the idea of myelin plasticity, of activity-dependent changes in myelin that tune circuit dynamics and therefore function. And to introduce you to um, many of the people who have led this work in my laboratory, this is Erin Gibson, who was my very first postdoctoral fellow. She's now leading her own independent laboratory, um, also at Stanford. Uh, this is Anna Garrity, who is a senior postdoc in the lab, Juliet Knowles, who's also just begun her own independent laboratory at Stanford, and Belgen Yelson, who is on the job market right now. Um, and, and what Erin, Anna, Juliet, um, and Belgen have done is to leverage tools of modern neuroscience to better understand glial biology. Um, and so one tool that we've used a lot is that of in vivo optogenetics, which allows for control of targeted populations of cells that express light sensitive um, ion channels. In this case, the cation uh, channel, channel rhodopsin 2, expressed in cortical projection neurons. And if we then stimulate these cortical projection neurons in the deep layers of cortex by delivering blue light from the surface of the brain, and we do this in the motor planning or M2 cortex, this will elicit complex motor behavior from the mouse. We see this, um, you know, uh, complex motor behavioral outputs. We know that we've successfully recruited activity within the circuit in a physiomimetic way. And then we can ask really straightforward questions about how other cell types within the stimulated circuit respond to changes in neuronal activity. And what we found a number of years now uh, ago now is that um, activity in cortical projection neurons elicits a circuit-specific proliferation of oligodendroglial lineage precursors, and, and actually really specifically in the corticocolossal projections, not the corticospinal projections of that circuit. We can fate map those cells over time by labeling with the thymidine analog EDU. And what we find is that the cells that proliferate in the corticocolossal projections of the premotor circuit um, over time differentiate into mature oligodendrocytes and that the myelinated ultrastructure of that circuit changes. And it changes in a way that we would predict would influence circuit dynamics and therefore function. And indeed, what we found is that over time, there was an improvement in mouse motor functional performance that depended upon these myelin changes. 
And so what are the molecular mechanisms that mediate these interactions between neurons and oligodendroglial cells? Well, one, um, one molecular hypothesis that we have is that activity-regulated secretion of the neurotrophin, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, or BDNF, signaling to its receptor trek B on oligodendrocyte precursor cells might be an important part of that mechanism. And so we tested that molecular hypothesis using two different genetically engineered mouse models. In one mouse model generated by Mike Greenberg's lab, lab and given to us in collaboration, um, there are baseline levels of BDNF um, expression and secretion, uh, but no activity regulated increase in BDNF expression and secretion because the Krebs binding site in promoter four of the BDNF gene has been deleted. In a second gen genetically engineered mouse model, instead of modulating the BDNF ligand, we instead modulated um, the uh, OPC-specific expression of the BDNF receptor, TREC-B, conditionally and inducibly deleting TREC-B just from oligodendrocyte precursor cells at various points in postnatal development or adulthood. And what we found was that when, if we optogenetically stimulated cortical projection neuronal activity in either of these genetically engineered mouse models, that the expected um, oligodendroglial response, this expected increase in OPC proliferation that we see in the BDNF or the TREK-B wild type mice is completely lost in mice that either lack activity regulated BDNF expression and secretion or OPC specific expression of the receptor TREK-B. As there's no OPC proliferation elicited in these mouse models by neuronal activity, there's also no oligodendrogenesis, and we find no myelin changes. And so while we, while we believe that the activity-regulated mechanism communicating um, experience and activity between neurons and oligodendric glial cells is more complex than simply this neurotrophin um, signal. We know that at least for cortical projection neurons, that this is one required component of the activity regulated response. And so that gives us a molecular handle to begin to ask questions about how activity regulated myelination may specifically contribute um, to neural circuit function in health and, and in disease. And so using this strategy, we and others using either um, conditional deletion of TREC-B just from oligodendric glial cells or um, an alternate strategy in which um, MRF, which is a transcription factor required for oligodendric glial differentiation is deleted, have uncovered roles for um, activity dependent myelin plasticity across a range of different neurological functions, including um, motor function, motor learning, attention, and uh, short-term memory, memory consolidation, spatial memory consolidation, and fear memory consolidation, um, social interactions, um, and, and many others are beginning to emerge. Adaptive changes in myelin, it, it is becoming clear, can tune circuit function. The cellular mechanisms of myelin plasticity include both de novo myelination of previously unmyelinated axons or axon segments, as well as myelin remodeling by existing oligodendrocytes, either extending or retracting myelin internodes or changing the thickness of myelin. We can quantify these changes by looking at the number of myelinated axons, which reflects changes in de novo myelination, as well as measuring internode length and myelin sheath thickness. These relatively subtle changes in myelination within a circuit can have important functional effects on circuit dynamics, and these small changes alter circuit dynamics to tune the circuit in an adaptive way, promoting coordinated circuit function. Roles for myelin plasticity, as, as I mentioned, have now been uncovered um, in, in the healthy brain relevant to attention, memory, learning, motor function, and learning, and can promote myelin regeneration. But given these roles in healthy cognitive function, it makes some sense that if myelin plasticity were disrupted, that that might contribute to, to cognitive impairment. And indeed, we find that myelin plasticity is an important component of the, the pathophysiology of the cognitive impairment that happens in the context of um, cancer therapy. So it's very common that after cancer therapy, there is um, a, a very reproducible syndrome of cognitive impairment characterized by impaired 
attention, memory, speed of information processing, and multitasking. And we found that um, one key aspect of that is um, neuroinflammation, actually microglial reactivity mediated loss of myelin homeostasis and plasticity. Given that the mechanism of um, cancer therapy related cognitive impairment loss of myelin plasticity is, is chiefly um, inflammatory in nature, we worried that um, the brain fog that people were experiencing so commonly after even relatively mild COVID might relate to similar mechanisms. And so in collaboration with Akiko Iwasaki's lab, more recently, we've been studying how mild respiratory restricted SARS-CoV-2 infection um, may dysregulate myelin. So in this mouse model that was uh, developed by the Iwasaki lab, we can restrict SARS-CoV-2 infection just to the respiratory system because only the respiratory system express, is, is engineered to express human ACE2. In this mouse model, which elicits a very mild um, uh, reaction in mice, they clear the infection by about um, one week. There's no evidence of brain infection whatsoever, and they don't ex ex exhibit much sickness behavior. Despite that, somehow the immune response in the lung is transmitted um, to the brain and elicits white matter microglial reactivity. Together with this microglial reactivity, as we see after cancer therapy, we find a decrease in both um, oligodendrocytes as well as in myelinated axons. And, and the loss of myelinated axons after mild respiratory COVID is commensurate with what we see in the context of um, can models of cancer chemotherapy. It's a very similar degree of myelinated axons. While loss of myelin homeostasis and plasticity may contribute to impaired cognition in, in a range of disease states, it's also possible that aberrantly increased um, adaptive myelination can contribute to disease, particularly diseases that are characterized by abnormal levels or abnormal patterns of activity, such as generalized epilepsy. And so in work led by Juliet Knowles in my lab, we've recently um, examined how maladaptive myelination contributes to the pathophysiology of um, epilepsy syndromes using uh, both rat and mouse models of absence generalized epilepsy. We find that after the, um, after the initiation of the seizure syndrome, that there is this increase in, my, in myelination, both um, G ratio, which reflects the thickness of the myelin sheath, as well as the number of myelinated axons. If we measure the interictal um, inter coherence between different nodes within the seizure network, we find that blocking activity dependent myelination. Um, using that model that I described earlier, conditionally deleting the TREC B receptor just from oligodendrocyte precursor cells to prevent this activity regulated myelin response that decreases the synchrony between nodes in the seizure network. And accordingly, as, as epilepsy really is a disease of hypersynchronization within the seizure network, we find that the um, increase in seizure frequency that happens in mice with intact myelin plasticity can be prevented uh, by preventing adaptive myelin changes. So myelin plasticity is important for neural circuit function. Loss of myelin plasticity can contribute to diseases of cognition. Aberrantly increased myelin plasticity can contribute to diseases of network hypersynchrony like epilepsy. But could these really powerful neuronglial interactions be subverted in the context of glial malignancies? So I'd like to now focus the rest of the talk on the idea of malignant myelin plasticity, of activity-dependent growth of glial malignancies. And to introduce you to some of the people who've led this work. Um, this is Hamsa Venkatesh, who was a, a just absolutely brilliant um, cancer biology PhD student in my lab. She uh, stayed with me for a very brief postdoc and then has gone on to start her own laboratory at Harvard. Yuen Pan, um, who just finished her postdoctoral fellow, uh, fellowship with me and is now an assistant professor at MD Anderson, and current postdoctoral fellows, um, Kathy, uh, Katie Taylor and Tara Baer.
And these are the diseases that as a pediatric neuro-oncologist, I think about all the time um, and that my laboratory focuses on uh, glial malignancies of childhood, which as I mentioned earlier, arise in a very predictable spatiotemporal pattern. For example, optic pathway gliomas, um, which commonly arise in the context of the neurofibromatosis type one tumor predisposition syndrome tend to happen in very early childhood. These are low grade glial malignancies that are debilitating and can cause blindness, um, but tend not to be lethal. In contrast, um, the, this, this malignancy, which tends to occur in mid-childhood, peaking in incidence around age six, diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma is a universally lethal um, childhood brain cancer driven by a very specific mutation in a histone gene, uh, H3K27M. And a, a, another tumor similarly driven by the same histone mutation that also happens um, in the central nervous system midline is called thalamic glioma. Together, these tumors are referred to as diffuse midline gliomas. Um, both are universally fatal, high-grade malignancies that uh, represent the leading cause of cancer-related death in children. In adolescence and young adulthood, the, the pattern of glial malignancies tends to move away from the midline and instead to occur in the cerebral hemispheres. Um, while these pediatric um, high-grade gliomas like pediatric glioblastoma resemble radiographically their adult counterparts, adult glioblastoma. Um, these are molecularly distinct diseases from their adult counterparts. And the idea that interactions between neurons and glioma cells might be important actually is something that a neuropathologist uh, named Shear recognized uh, goodness, nearly a hundred years ago, when he described a very interesting interaction between neurons in the tumor microenvironment and the malignant glioma cells uh, that surround them. This is characteristic of gliomas. And just to, to show you um, in cartoon form what he was uh, describing here um, in this uh, micrograph, in the tumor microenvironment, there are many, many neural structures, both uh, neuronal cell bodies as well as axon tracts, and gliomas cluster in very tight microanatomical association around mature neurons and invade along their axons. The idea that neural activity might similarly promote the proliferation of malignant glioma cells as it does their normal counterparts is something that I thought a lot about as I was looking at um, you know, similar micrographs of patients of mine. And this particular H&E image, which so clearly shows this secondary structure of shear, um, now also called uh, perineuronal satellitosis, um, comes from an early autopsy specimen from a five-year-old patient of mine, um, somebody that I took care of when I was a, a neuro-oncology fellow. And it was this child's tumor donation at the time of his death that allowed um, me to generate the first cell culture and xenograph mouse model of this particular kind of childhood glioma. And it's really through similar such incredibly selfless donations of tumor, um, tumor tissue that we're able to do all of the work that we do. So I just want to acknowledge that incredibly important contribution of patients and their families. To test whether um, malignant glioma cells respond to neural activity as their healthy oligodendroglial precursor counterparts, we did that same experiment that I described to you earlier, optogenetically stimulating cortical projection neurons, but this time in the context of a diffusely infiltrating pediatric um, hemispheric glioma. And what we found was that the malignant cells, just like normal oligodendrocyte precursors, increase their rate of proliferation in response to neuronal activity and in a circuit specific way, which results in an overall increase in tumor burden within the stimulated circuit. Brain activity can drive brain cancer growth. More recently in collaboration with David Gutman's lab, um, we've examined a model, a genetically engineered mouse model of low-grade glioma that ha happens in association with the tumor predisposition syndrome neurofibromatosis type 1. And in this mouse model in which nearly 100% of mice develop tumors specifically within their optic nerve and optic chiasm, 
them at exactly nine weeks of age, we find that if we optogenetically stimulate optic nerve activity prior to the onset of these tumors, beginning around six weeks of age, that the tumors that develop are much larger than those that occur in their identically manipulated but not optogenetically stimulated litter mate control counterparts. Now, this optic nerve um, glioma model represents a really exciting op opportunity to ask questions not only about tumor growth, but also about tumor initiation, because we know exactly where and when these tumors emerge. And they occur in a, um, a very convenient circuit that can be modulated, the activity of which can be modulated just with changing visual experience. And so we find that if we um, take mice that are destined to develop optic pathway glioma and put them in um, complete darkness, 24 hour cycles of darkness. Um, and if we do this just around the time or just after the time of expected tumor initiation, that the tumors that form are much smaller and many fewer than those that occur in um, their litter mate control counterparts raised with normal visual experience, simply in 12 hours of light, 12 hours of dark cycles. If instead we place these mice in darkness prior to the onset of tumors at six weeks of age, then no tumors form as evidenced by normal um, uh, optic nerve volume, and normal proliferation indices within the optic nerve. This is this lack of tumor genesis is despite um, having this oncogenic mutation that drives tumor genesis in 100% of animals with normal uh, optic nerve activity and, and occurs even if we replace the mice into normal visual experience after what appears to be a critical period for tumor genesis in these mice. So what are the um, you know, factors that are regulating these really powerful interactions between neurons and glioma cells? Well, we first hypothesize that there may be important activity-regulated paracrine growth factors secreted in response to neural activity that regulate the cancer cell proliferation, similar to what we found with healthy uh, myelin plasticity um, and, and BDNF. Uh, so to, to ask this question, we took explants of either healthy mouse cortex or mouse optic nerve together um, with the retina, and we put those explants in simple artificial cerebrospinal fluid media, and then collected the secreted factors into that um, simple medium when neurons in the explants were at varying levels of neural activity, either spontaneously active or optogenetically stimulated, um, or in a third group, silenced um, using the voltage-gated sodium channel blocker to trototoxin. And what we find is that when we place conditioned medium um, from these explants on the cultures of glioma cells, that there is an activity dose-dependent increase in glioma cell proliferation lost when neuronal activity is silenced with trototoxin. We find that this response to um, conditioned medium from active um, brain or uh, retina plus optic nerve explants is conserved across multiple different forms of both high and low grade glioma, including pediatric forms of glioma, hemispheric pediatric glioblastoma, histone mutant diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma, IDH wild type adult glioblastoma, IDH mutant, mutant adult anaplastic oligodendroglioma, and NF1-associated optic pathway glioma. So what's in that condition medium? Well, um, summarizing a couple years of uh, biochemistry and proteomic experiments with a single text box, we found that the key activity-regulated factors were, not surprisingly, brain brain-derived neurotrophic factor, just like it plays a, a role in, in, in healthy neuron glial interactions. But really unexpectedly, we found a shed form of the synaptic adhesion molecule neuroligin-3. Now, neuroligin-3 was really unexpected, um, but it, it functions as a very robust glioma mitogen. Um, neuroligin-3, is, as I think this audience knows well, is a postsynaptic adhesion molecule first discovered by Tom Sudolf. Um, it was not known to be a mitogen in any context, and actually it wasn't even known to be shed, but we find that neuroligin-3 is shed um, in a strictly activity-dependent way through the enzymatic activity of a metalloprotease called ADAM10 
releasing this large N terminal ectodomain into the tumor microenvironment. Well, the next set of questions that we asked was what cell type is releasing Erlogan 3? Um, and when we look at gene expression databases, we find that, of course, neurons express um, a lot of Erlogan 3, and, and certainly neurons are a, a famously postsynaptic cell type. But also, um, we know that oligodendrocyte precursor cells are a postsynaptic cell type, and it turns out they express very high levels of Erlogan 3. When we conditionally deleted Neuralgin 3 in a cell type specific way, either from subpopulations of neurons or from oligodendrocyte precursor cells, we found that the major source of shed Neuralgin 3 was actually oligodendrocyte precursors. Placing the OPC in the tumor microenvironment for the first time, but also asking really interesting questions that we're working to answer about what role um, Neuralgin 3 is playing in healthy myelin biology. So how important is um, this mechanism of activity regulated neuroligin 3 shedding? There are many cell intrinsic mechanisms by which glioma cells grow, as well as a number of different microenvironmental mechanisms. And so to ask about the relative importance, we did a pretty simple set of experience, uh, experiments. We simply xenografted brain cancer cells into the environment of either the neuroligin 3 wild type or neuroligin 3 knockout brain. And what we found was really unexpected. Rather than just slowing in their growth, these tumors utterly stagnated in the absence of neuroligin 3 uh, from the tumor microenvironment. This was true across multiple different forms of glioma in multiple brain regions, including both pediatric and adult forms of glioblastoma, um, these diffuse midline gliomas is integrated either to the pons or to the cortex. But this apparent dependency on um, microenvironmental neuroligin 3 did not extend to a patient-drive model of breast cancer brain metastasis, suggesting that while this was really important across multiple different forms of both high as well as low-grade glioma, neuroligin 3 was also the key mechanism regulating activity, regulated um, uh, optic pathway glioma initiation and growth. Um, this does not extend to all forms of brain cancer. So I've just told you that neuroligin 3 is this really interesting um, therapeutic target and that ADAM10 is the enzyme that mediates its cleavage and release into the tumor microenvironment. And so we tested the idea that by inhibiting ADAM10, we may slow these various forms of high and low grade glioma. And indeed we find that across multiple different forms of um, high, high grade glioma, pediatric hemispheric glioblastoma, diffuse midline glioma of the pons, um, hemispheric glioma of adulthood, as well as this um, optic pathway um, glioma occurring in, in association with neurofibromatosis type one, that we can starkly inhibit tumor growth and progression. And so I'm pleased to say that this is a, um, a clinical strategy that I've brought to clinical trial nationally, and um, we're presently testing the safety and efficacy of um, ADAM10 inhibition in childhood gliomas. But why is neuroligin 3 such an important mechanism? You know, what do we know about this, um, this really interesting molecule? Well, you know, once neuroligin 3 is shed from the postsynaptic membrane through the enzymatic activity of the metalloprotease ADAM10, it then interacts with cell surface um, uh, proteins on the glioma cell membrane that we're working hard to identify and then triggers numerous oncogenic signaling pathways. There's early and upstream uh, stimulation of focal adhesion kinase, downstream stimulation of SARC, RAS, and PI3 kinase mTOR pathway. So that helps to explain neuroligin 3's sufficiency in driving glioma proliferation and growth. But it actually doesn't explain this really unexpected dependency. And so we dug deeper and we looked at the gene expression changes attributable to neuroligin 3 binding and found unexpectedly that when neuroligin 3 binds to the glioma cell, that it upregulates a number of synapse-associated genes. There's a feed-forward effect of neuroligin 3 on its own expression in the glioma cell, together with upregulation of the BDNF receptor TREK-B, but also a number of glutamate receptor subunits and other synapse-associated structural proteins. When we examine primary biopsy samples from the major classes of um, of high-grade glioma, including uh, these H3K27M mutant diffuse midline gliomas shown in, in gray, 
IDH wild type hemispheric glioma is shown in red and IDH mutant hemispheric glioma is shown in purple. We do indeed see in the malignant cells uh, robust expression of AMPA receptor subunits, the neuroligans, um, other synapse associated structural proteins. And so this brings for us kind of the, what seemed at the time crazy idea that like there are synapses between neurons and healthy oligodendrocyte precursor cells, there might be also synapses between neurons and malignant glioma cells. Well, when we look by immunoelectron microscopy in which we can unambiguously identify the malignant cells based on immunogold labeling, we do see these very clear synaptic structures, um, presynaptic vesicles, a postsynaptic density and a synaptic cleft. Testing the hypothesis that perhaps in, in, in maybe its most fundamental role, neuroligin-3 is promoting the formation of these structural synapses by regulating synaptic gene expression, we find that far fewer of these neurontic glioma synapses form in the absence of microenvironmental neuroligin-3. But are these surprising neurontoglioma synapses actually functional, or are these just a shadow of the cell type from which we believe that these tumors emerge? Well, we can test that using um, patch clamp electrophysiology, um, uh, patch clamping onto GFP labeled glioma cells that had been xenografted months before into um, a very tractable and, and easy to work with circuit in the hippocampus. And then we can do acute slice electrophysiology. And after recording from the glioma cells, we can dye fill them with biocytin to ensure that the cells that we were recording from were indeed malignant cells. We did this experiment in collaboration with Ramalenka's lab. And, and what we found was that in a subset of the glioma cells, that there were these very clear postsynaptic, um, excitatory postsynaptic currents. These depended upon action potentials. They were blocked by tetrodotoxin. They exhibit multiple electrophysiological characteristics of bona fide synapses, including paired pulse facilitation and quantal single vesicle events, mini EPSCs. More specifically, this first type of synapse that we identified um, were mediated, are mediated by um, calcium permeable AMPA receptors. Now in the healthy brain, um, AMPA receptors can undergo adaptive mechanisms of adaptive plasticity. And we wondered uh, whether this might be happening in the glioma cells as well. When we um, you know, examine the gene expression profile of these cells, you know, we don't find that there's much NMDA receptor expression at all in these cancers, which is interesting. <laughs> and so NMDA mediated mechanisms of postsynaptic plasticity um, are, are unlikely to be at play. But we wondered whether BDNF, which we know to play a role in the tumors, uh, might be contributing uh, to mechanisms of adaptive plasticity. And indeed, we find that if we uh, perfuse a, xenogra a tumor xenografted hippocampal slice with BDNF, that there's an increase in the amplitude of the postsynaptic current, and that this depends upon glioma cell expression of the BDNF receptor TREC-B. If we CRISPR delete the gene that encodes TREC-B and TREC-2 from the glioma cells prior to xenografting them to the hippocampus, this abrogates the effect of BDNF on, um, on tumor cell postsynaptic current amplitude. Summarizing um, a lot of work that is available in this bioarchive preprint right now, we find that this is mediated through a postsynaptic mechanism of adaptive plasticity, which by which BDNF uh, to track B signaling in the tumor cell increases AMPA receptor trafficking to the postsynaptic membrane. We then wondered if there were other kinds of synapses um, occurring in glioma cells. And I should mention that this first kind of synapse that we identified, um, these AMPA receptor mediated synapses, we were found in both pediatric gliomas as well as in adult um, hemispheric gliomas. There was a, another group in Germany that similarly found these neuron to glioma um, AMPA receptor mediated synapses in adult glioblastoma led by uh, Frank Winkler. When we look though at um, gene expression profiles in these terrible pediatric cancers and diffuse midline gliomas like diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma, we see that there's actually quite robust GABA-A receptor expression. 
And we find that if, you know, in, if we repeat that experiment um, with um, uh, patch clamp electrophysiology in hippocampal xenografted slices, and instead of blocking GABA receptors, we block the AMPA receptors. When we uh, stimulate those Schaefer collateral or the local afferents, we find that there is a um, GABAergic current blocked with picrotoxin. And the GABA um, allosteric modulators like benzodiazepines increase those currents in the diffuse midline glioma cells. These seem to be more specific to the diffuse midline gliomas. We see that GABA-A receptor expression is really prominent in um, diffuse midline glioma tumor cells, but comparing those to hemispheric tumors, we see very minimal um, expression of GABA-A receptors. When we patch clamp um, either diffuse midline glioma cells, shown here in black, or hemispheric um, glioblastoma cells, shown in blue, we find that there really are GABA evoked currents only in the diffuse midline glioma cells. We also find that like immature neurons and neural precursor cells, the GABA currents in these cancer cells are depolarizing. When we look at the reversal potentials, that indicates that this depolarization, as we might expect, is due to intratumoral um, elevation and in intracellular chloride, and that this in turn depends upon NKCC1 expression and can be blocked with uh, bumetanide. When we calculate the intracellular chloride concentration of diffuse midline glioma cells or these hemispheric um, glioblastoma cells, we see that there really is quite a stark difference in intracellular chloride concentration. And so this suggests that if there are GABAergic synapses in diffuse midline glioma cells, that, that GABAergic interneurons may be playing an important role in tumor progression. And so we tested this um, again using optogenetics, this time expressing um, light sensitive um, uh, carmine opsins in uh, uh, inter GABAergic interneurons under control of the DLX promoter. And what we find is that if we optogenetically um, stimulate interneuronal activity, that that drives the proliferation rate of the tumor cells. There is also a third kind of current that we find in these tumor cells that is not synaptic in nature. It's, it's much longer um, in duration than synaptic currents. And interestingly, it scales with field potential. So the more neurons in the tumor microenvironment are active, the larger and longer these currents are. And what we determine that these currents represent are more astrocyte-like activity-dependent potassium-evoked currents. These can be elicited by potassium alone um, and can be blocked with barium, which blocks potassium channels. Now, really beautiful work from Frank Winkler's lab again had shown that tumor cells connect to each other through gap junctions. And we wondered whether this tumor to tumor gap junctional coupling might be serving to amplify some of these currents. And indeed we find that if we block gap junctions, and we did this in a number of different ways, I'm showing you um, pharmacological blockade right now with a migraine medicine called meclofenamate, uh, we find that this decreases the amplitude of these potassium evoked currents. So what I've just told you in summary is that these cancer cells are integrating into the neural circuits that they are invading. They're doing this through bona fide neuron to glioma synapses that are then elaborated and reinforced through mechanisms of malignant adaptive plasticity, as well as electrically through activity dependent potassium evoked currents that are amplified in a gap junction coupled network. Given that there are multiple ways by which the cancer cells can undergo membrane depolarization, and given that that's a very metabolically expensive thing for a cell to do, we, we hypothesize that the membrane depolarization itself may be driving glioma cell proliferation and progression. And that would make some sense because we know that in the developing brain, that membrane depolarization of um, embryonic stem and progenitor cells actually regulates its um, proliferation and differentiation. So we thought that perhaps the glioma cells were hijacking a voltage dependent mechanism of growth as well. So we tested this hypothesis again using optogenetics, but this time 
expressing the light sensitive channel rhodopsin 2, not in the microenvironmental neurons, but rather in the tumor cells themselves. And in this way, we can use blue light to evoke membrane depolarization in the tumor cells. If we optogenetically depolarize a glioma xenograft in the cortex, that does indeed increase the rate of tumor cell proliferation. While conversely, if we block synaptic communication between neurons and the glioma cells, either pharmacologically or genetically, here I'm showing you expression of a, a dominant negative version of the AMPA receptor subunit GLUA2 expressed in the tumor cells, this has a stark growth inhibitory effect. We can visualize this electrical activity in the cancer using genetically encoded calcium indicators like GCAMP6S. And here you see that when we stimulate Schaefer collaterals that this evokes a calcium transient. This is um, activity dependent, locked um, with tetrodotoxin. And of course we don't need to stimulate the axonal afferents. There's spontaneous activity of neurons in these acute slices. And I think that this particular calcium imaging movie really underscores what is for me a very startling realization that this cancer is an electrically active tissue. And that is not how we have been approaching either understanding it or treating it. We now as a field need to understand the mechanisms of malignant circuit assembly, plasticity and evolution over the disease course to determine the granular details of these voltage sensitive mechanisms of tumor cell proliferation. And I suggest that in doing so, we will glean really important insights for normal neural development and plasticity viewed through the magnified lens of these glial cancers. Already, this new understanding is providing important insights for glioma therapy inspired by neuroscience. As I mentioned, reducing AMPA receptor synaptic currents, um, in this case, rather than genetically, by applying an AMPA receptor targeting anti-epileptic drug, anti-seizure drug called parampinol, we can decrease the proliferation rate of the cancer. If instead we reduce GABAergic currents, and it turns out that there is an anti-seizure medicine called levetiracetam that decreases these tumor cell GABAergic currents, we're not sure how it does this. It may relate to SV2A um, uh, binding and, and, really, and prevention of presynaptic release, but we need to understand this. Regardless, it does re reduce these, these currents, and that decrease increases tumor cell proliferation in multiple different models of diffuse midline glioma. That then extends life, um, extends survival in mouse models of diffuse midline glioma. And when we examine retrospective real world data from children with diffuse midline glioma, who for various reasons were on levetiracetam, th that shows you know, data that is consistent with the um, conclusion that this may be an important therapeutic strategy. Of course, any um, clinical data needs to be repeated in a prospective clinical trial. Uh, Levetiracetam in mice and in humans, um, you know, has, has very different effects in uh, hemispheric gliomas compared with diffuse midline glomas. And just to remind you of this uh, trace from before, we, we find that there are prominent depolarizing currents elicited um, by GABA in diffuse midline gliomas, but not in hemispheric high-grade gliomas. And accordingly, we don't find any effect of levetiracetam in hemispheric gliomas, nor do we find an effect of um, in, in patients who took levetiracetam who have hemispheric high-grade gliomas, very different than what we see with diffuse midline gliomas. Conversely, agonizing, increasing the GABA current using allosteric modulators like benzodiazepines actually increases tumor cell proliferation uh, in mouse models. So we need to understand each of these neurophysiological medications and to use them very carefully in the, in the specific disease context in which they act. Already a number of targets um, are beginning to emerge for glioma therapy, including potentially neuroligin-3 cleavage and binding, AMPA receptor dependent signaling, gap junctions, neurotrophin signaling, GABA signaling, potassium channels, and synaptogenic factors. I'd like to propose that 
in addition to targeting these neurophysiological targets um, for their own you know, benefit, they also may really importantly synergize with immuno-oncology strategies. For example, CAR T-cell therapy, which is something that um, I've personally been, been very engaged in for these terrible diffuse midline gliomas, is showing great promise in some patients. Um, but in others, we find that the therapeutic response is only partial and is insufficiently durable. And part of the reason for that is that these tumors just grow so fast. And so could we be targeting these neuron cancer interactions to slow tumor growth in order to help our T cells and other immuno-oncology strategies outpace the tumor growth? The neuroscience of glioma um, requires a, a great deal more understanding. What we know already is that neuronal activity drives glioma progression, both through paracrine growth factors, as well as through neuron to glioma synapses and potassium evoked currents. At, at the same time that neuronal activity drives glioma growth, the gliomas influence the hyperexcitability and activity of neurons through secretion of glutamate and other synaptogenic factors. And I think that the mechanistic parallels evident in healthy neuron glial interactions and malignant neuron glioma interactions really underscores the extent to which these tumors are simply hijacking mechanisms of normal neural development and plasticity and really demand that we begin to approach these tumors from a neuroscience perspective. And I will conclude with the idea that the neuroscience of cancer is important beyond just central nervous system tumors. Just as we've discovered that there are important electrochemical interactions between neurons and cancer cells in the brain and in glioma, now Hanahan's group has shown that breast cancer brain metastases also derive glutamatergic signaling from a more astrocyte-like perisynaptic location and that there are tumors in the periphery that are similarly regulated by interactions with the nervous system. This has been evident between interactions of peripheral nerves, often autonomic nerves, parasympathetic and sympathetic um, nerves, and, and a variety of different cancer types through paracrine signaling of growth factors and neurotrophins, and just as we see in the central nervous system, just as, as neural elements are driving cancer progression, the cancer cells are secreting factors um, that encourage axonal ingrowth into the tumor microenvironment that remodel the nervous system in a way that sets up a really vicious cycle of interactions that drive malignancies. There are also really important systemic neural cancer interactions that include neural and cancer influences on the immune system, tumor-induced dysregulation of sleep, mood, and cognition. Many people um, to thank, I want to highlight all of the people in my lab, past and present, who contributed to the work that I just showed you, our wonderful collaborators, funding sources, and of course, the patients and families whose donation of tumor tissue enables the work that we do. Hopefully there's some time left at the end here for some questions.